Hello, ladies. Welcome back to another Tea Time Tuesday. Um, Before we get into our lesson, let's go ahead and have some prayer. Lord God, I thank you once again um, for allowing us to see you another day. I thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Lord, on today, I just ask that you would cover us, open up our hearts and our minds to truly receive and hear your word on today. And God, I pray that you would use me as you see fit, Lord. Help me to teach this lesson in a way that glorifies you and is pleasing unto you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. Thank God and amen. All right. So, um, for those who might be new, we are coming from the devotional book. I almost said the other book, y'all. We're coming from a devotional book. A uh, woman of God wonderfully made, and we are on week five devotionals. Right now we're looking at the scripture, Romans 1 and 1, and we're doing a word study is for week five, lesson one, Romans 1, uh, verse 1. Okay, and right now we are looking at the word God which we just learned this particular word in this particular verse is the word theos, right? We talked about theos, um, you know, when it's used with the article in the Greek, right, which sometimes is translated into English and sometimes it isn't. But um, when this word is used with an article in the Greek, it is in reference to our God, um, supreme divinity right, the one true God. When we don't have that article, it's the little g, right? Uh, It's just a deity, a God, okay? And right now we're just talking about some of his divine attributes, which we also learn, right? Divine attributes are things that only God has, okay? So, again, you know, we were made in his image. We have been made in his image, rather. And because of that, we there are some attributes that we share with him. However, divine attributes are things that only God has, right? Or as we, uh, you know, learned, it's the right. These are things that are pre, <clears throat> excuse me, pre predicated of him. Okay. So uh, the last thing we talked about, right, was his universality. How God is for. Everyone. He has created all the nations, all peoples. Again, when we look at Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 27, and I'm quoting the, the King James here, right? So God made man in his image. In the image of God made he him. In the image of God, male and female, sorry, created he them. Right? Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, King James Version. We have to remember when we read that, it doesn't just apply to us, the believer. He made every human being on this earth, okay? But as we also are, right, the invitation is there. But we're not, you know, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not in the family, right? You are not a child of God. You are creation, okay? So... Um, the rest of these, there are some scriptures with them. However, um, I'm going to give you guys those scriptures, but it's for you to go and study and read on your own because we have quite a few um, for these attributes. However, there are some that we're specifically going to try to get to today, like I say, right? However many we get to is however many we get to. We're going to try to take our time and, you know, look at these specific ones that God had me highlight, okay? But the rest of these, y'all will go and read on your own. I really want y'all to start, um, you know, studying and reading for yourselves, okay? So. Um, I will try to make sure I remember to put them in the, uh, not the description box, Lord, help me, <laughs> to put them 
the scriptures in the comments right under the video on, on YouTube. Um, but also remember, you can go back and play these videos again so that, okay, I didn't, I didn't get it that first time. Well, you can go back and listen to it again and pause it and rewind, right? <laughs> the beauty of technology, okay? So for this first one or this next one, is talking about his almighty power, almighty power. For this, they give us Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Remember that, you know, it's like the three O's, right? God is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, right? Uh, omnipotent, right? All powerful, omnipresent, all places at all times. He's everywhere all at once. And then <clears throat> omnipresent, oh, I'm sorry, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, <laughs> omniscient. All-knowing, he knows about everything that has happened since the beginning of time, and he knows the future light years before we do. He knows your every thought. He knows what's going to happen before it happens. He knows what you need before you even realize that you need it. Okay? So almighty power, right? We have some power because of Christ, Holy Spirit in us, but... He has all power because he is power itself, right? Just like he has all wisdom because God is wisdom, right? The fear of the Lord is, or wisdom is fear of the Lord, right? So he has all power, okay? And then his next one, infinite knowledge. Just talked about that, right? Omniscient, all-knowing, infinite knowledge. He knows what's going to happen long before it happens. And I think I shared that with y'all, right, about the whole thing about being Peter and the Lord telling me things like this is going to happen. You know, by the time you get to this this point, this is what's going to happen. Oh, I don't know about that guy. <laughs> I still think it's funny how, you know, God knows everything, and yet we act like we know more than he does. So. But for infinite knowledge, they give us the scripture references, Acts chapter 2, verse 33, chapter 15, verse 18, and Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Acts chapter 2, verse 33, chapter 15, verse 18. In Romans chapter 11, verse 33. The next one is creative power. Um, why do you think you're creative? Because God made you in his image. So again, we have this, we have some type of creativity. You may not be like a, a DIY person. You may not be that type of creative. You may not be an artsy creative, right? Like I write. There are people who sing. There are people who dance. There are people who paint. There are people who, uh, you know, model or do fashion or whatever, take, do photography, right? Graphic editors, comic illustrator. Like you may not be that type of, of creative, but then there are those people who, you know, maybe they work with like mechanical things. Maybe they are creative in, uh, you know, building things. You have some type of creativity, so you can't say, well, I'm not creative, because you were made by the creator who has what creative power. Again, we can't just speak stuff into existence. We ain't got that kind of power, right? What do I mean by that? I cannot be like, you know, like God spoke the world into existence, I, I don't have that kind of ability because if I did, 
I sure would be like, whoo, I speak a million dollars into my bank account. <laughs> right? Imagine if we did have that kind of power. You know, we're, I mean, I'm joking, right? But at the same time, like, really think about how dangerous that would also be if somebody who didn't like you just decided to speak you out of existence or vice versa. You know, that's why we don't have that kind of power because we wouldn't even know. We we really would get out of hand with that. Okay? So he has all creative power. We have some ability, creative ability, because, again, we're made in his image, right? And we have some of that in us. Like he is in us, right? But ultimately, God is the one who has all the creative ability. He has all creative power. You think that you're great at doing whatever it is that you do? I guarantee you I can do it a thousand times better. Right? So, uh, scripture references for this. Romans chapter 11, verse 36. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. Ephesians Chapter 3, verse 9. Revelation, chapter 4, verse 11. And chapter 10, verse 6. And that's it. So one more time. Romans, chapter 11, verse 36. 1 Corinthians, chapter 8, verse 6. Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 9, Revelation, chapter 4, verse 11, and chapter 10, verse 6. Okay. The next one is absolute holiness. Absolute holiness. Remember that scripture that I kept referencing, right? Our righteousness is that of a filthy rag. That is why Christ had to give himself on the cross, right? And then we learned about that, how that is called the great exchange because for our sinfulness was exchanged. In exchange, we got his righteousness. He took our sinfulness on the cross, and then he defeated all that stuff on the cross, okay? So God is absolute holiness. Um, There are other scriptures as well where it says, in him is no evil, darkness at all. God is good. He is everything good and everything holy and everything righteous and just. Nothing in him. There is no darkness. There is no evil in him at all. Which is also good to remember that when God is making decisions and he starts removing, strategically removing certain people and things from your life, when he starts, you know, detouring you from your plans, when he starts interrupting things in your life, remember that your God is a good God. He is the good God. He's absolutely holy and righteous and fair in what he's doing. But also remember, right, that should be a reminder for us as well, that uh, God does not tolerate any type of unrighteousness. You're not going to put up with that. Okay. So, scripture references for this are 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 15, and 1 John, chapter 1, verse 5. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 15, and First John chapter 1, verse 5. Okay. Next one is righteousness. I was just talking about that, right? <laughs> Holiness and righteousness go hand in hand. Can't really have one without the other. Okay. Um, for scripture reference for this is John. Chapter 17, 
verse 25. John chapter 17, verse 25. Remember, you know, and isn't it interesting, right? Self righteousness is focused on your form of righteousness. And again, going back to that scripture, I feel like I need to memorize that for myself. Your righteousness is filthy. Your righteousness does not mean diddly squat. But his righteousness is everything. Because even when I fall short, he covers me. Okay? So next one is faithfulness. Again, we we don't have that ability because we are going to fall short. We are, right? Now, I'm not saying, you know, oh, man, babe, I'm sorry I cheated on you. You know, I'm only, I'm only human. I'm imperfect. No, no, that's not, no, no, no. But I feel like, especially as women, there are times where we make promises or we try to be there for everybody. We try to show up for everybody, and you just can't. And especially if you, you know, for those of us who, um, you know, get caught up in people-pleasing, it gets to a point where you're so, you're stressed out so thin, you, there's no way you can show up for anybody else, and yet you're constantly trying to just, well, I, I, you know, if I can just do, I can just do it if I squeeze just five more minutes Eventually, it gets to the point where you you will let somebody down. You're not going to be able to show up for them, right? You know, like, man, they showed up to this job faithfully. And even in that, it's like you have people who are more faithful to their to their job or you know, whatever than their own family. And it's one of those things. It, it has to be one or the other. Even with our relationship with God, we're not always faithful to him. Remember, Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means at some point, if you ever looked at somebody, you're like, whoo, that is a fun. You know, now again, it's one thing you seem like, okay, I see them, and you keep moving, right? It's another thing when you see the man and you staring him down and you just having all these lustful thoughts. You've committed adultery in your heart because God is your spouse before you before your natural spouse. So you've cheated. That's being unfaithful. If you've put anything before God, that's being unfaithful because now you're making an idol out of it. We have all been there at some point. Okay? So the only one who can truly say that they are faithful, no matter what, no matter what season, no matter what day it is, what time of the month it is, whatever, (laughs) is God. He's the only one who can say that he is faithful. Like, he's the only one we can say is faithful like that, that we can always count on. Okay? Uh, Scripture for this. I'm sorry, Scripture's reference for this is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, chapter 10, verse 13, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, 1 John Chapter 1, verse 9. And I don't know why that, that just came in my head, but if you are, like, trying to take notes, learning how to abbreviate the scriptures will help you save time a lot. Don't try to write out the whole the whole book, right? Um, there is, like, an abbreviation system. Like, I know in my, at least two of my Bibles, it does have, like, um, a little thing that shows me the abbreviations for each book of the Bible. And so I learned those, and, like, that's how I abbreviate them. And then for some of them, I have my own little thing, but do that, (laughs) okay? 
don't try to write out the entire word Corinthians. Um, you can just write, you know, Roman numeral one or the number one, D-O-R, period, and then the numbers. Because that will be a lot easier. Okay. I'll read them again. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, and chapter 10, verse 13. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. And First John, chapter one, verse nine. Next one is love. Um, it's funny because I think the other day I was listening to a podcast. It was either Thirty Minutes with Perry's or somebody else, and they made mention of it. Right, like love is a fruit of the spirit, right? It's it's an ingredient of the fruit of the spirit, which means that love comes from God, right? We don't know what love is because we have to first know him to know what it means to actually love, to know what love really is, okay? Um, and again, it's like, well, why? how is that a divine attribute? The kind of unconditional, self-sustaining, enduring type of love can only come from God. Again, when you're talking about depraved people, okay, um, all the hate and the evil that we have in the world, the scripture is very clear that our hearts have a, a tendency to kind of lean towards that, like if it was not for the Holy Spirit, for God moving in you, you, we all would be, we're all capable of doing some of the most unimaginable things. Some of us have been there in places where it's like, oh, I would never do that. And then you find yourself in a space, in this place where you're doing the very thing that you said you would never do. Right? So without God, it's like you don't even know what love is. You don't, you don't know what that kind of love is, to love somebody through their faults, to love somebody even when that person has hurt you multiple times? Yeah. <laughs> to love that love your enemy love? Yeah. Because it's easy. It's easy to love to love on the people that you like. To love on your favorite. Like, you know, I just love them. Ooh, I'm just, I, every time you see them, you just have, you do anything for that person. That other person come around and get in that last nerve. Mm, I don't know if I got time for them today. The people that you know don't like you. And you have a reason not to like, they just don't like you. They just, whatever. They just decide in their mind that they just don't like you. Now, sometimes, you know, we got to be real, right? I don't know why they don't like me. You don't know why they don't like you. <laughs> Look, that's between you and Jesus, right? But it's like, yeah, can you love those people too? This guy loves people. He's still waking up people who tell him they hate him every single day. He still covers them. He still loves them. Right? So, scripture references, or scripture reference for this is 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 16. 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 16. The next one is mercy. Ooh. Remember that God showing you mercy is you not getting what you actually deserve. 
scripture is clear, right? The wages of sin is death. Okay? Every time you were disobedient, when you were slowful, when you kept putting God on hold, when you purposely rebelled against him, and you act like you didn't know who he was anymore, do you understand what you actually deserved? But when somebody wrongs us, we want them to get the full punishment, right? We want the full thing. Like, no, they got to they gotta pay. They got to suffer for this. And yet, Jesus suffered for you, and he didn't do anything. He didn't do any of that stuff that you did. But he did it for you because he knew that you was going to need that advocate. He knew that you was going to need God's mercy on your life. Again, it, 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 our tendency as people, we don't want to be merciful. We want people to suffer. You know, we want them to get what they say, they just deserts. We want them to get all of it. But you didn't get all of it. Okay? So, and the thing is, it's like, yeah, mind you, though, these are things that God still expects from us, though. But again, we will never have these, these kind of divine attributes. We will never be on that level where it's like I got to a place where I was holy and righteous and I stayed that way forever and I never, ever, ever sinned again. You know, I used to be so inconsistent with God and then I find a sign that enough was enough and I just stayed faithful and I did every single thing that God told me to do. And I never, ever, ever became, un, you know, was unfaithful to God ever again. No. We're sin prone. There are going to be, you're going to have a day or a moment where you're not going to show mercy. You're not going to be loving. And you're going to have to repent. And you're going to find out, like, okay, well, I need to work in that area so that I can be. I can learn to be more merciful, more kind, more loving, more faithful, right? Okay? So for God's mercy, uh, scripture reference for this is Romans chapter 9, verses 15 and 18. Romans chapter 9, verses 15 and 18. And then we have fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. Again, if you have ever told even one lie in your life, you ain't got that kind of quality. (laughs) Remember, divine attribute, as in never, ever, 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 ever have told a lie, not even once. Scripture says God cannot lie because he is the truth. It is impossible for him to lie. You know, I laughed because it was, I think, a podcast by, like, Tim Keller, and he mentioned that in the the podcast. Like, you know, we said there's nothing God can't do, and it's like, well, that's not quite true because he can't lie. (laughs) I laughed. I was like, well, okay, you got me. That's true. He can't lie. He cannot. He's the truth. We, on the other hand, you know, I don't want to hurt their feelings. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was great. Yeah, girl, that looks great on you. You know it does not look good. You know it didn't look good, and you lied. Well, I mean, if that's if that's what you want to do, you know, I mean, yeah, it, it's your choice. And you know that was a horrible decision. Or when you choose not to stand on the truth, when you choose to be silent out of fear of, uh, you know, rebuke or backlash. Well, you know, I would tell them, but uh, now sometimes, yeah, the scripture does say sometimes, you know, it's wise to just be quiet. 
and especially in the presence of fools, just, just don't even say nothing. <laughs> right? Um, but when you know God is moving on you to say something, and it's like, well, I don't, don't want to be bothered with that. Uh, and again, it's funny how that works because then when He tells you to be quiet, you want to open your, you want to run your mouth. But anyway, <laughs> okay, this kind of truthfulness is something that only God has. He only He has that. Okay. Now, for this, we're going to look at the scriptures, okay? So let's go to Titus chapter 1, verse 2. Let's go there. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. And again, you know, as usual, I'll be coming from the Amplified Version. So this is Titus chapter 1, verse 2, and this is the Amplified Version. Based on the hope and divine guarantee of eternal life, the life which God, who is ever truthful and without deceit, promised before the ages of time began. I don't know why, look, first of all, Let's let's actually read verses one through three first. I just want to just be patient with me. I just want to do something. I promise it's not random. Okay, it just go with me. Okay, so let's read that again. Let's read verses. This is Titus chapter one, but we're going to read verses one through three, and I'm going to read in the Amplified first. Okay, so. Uh, again, Titus 1 through 3, Amplified. Paul, a bond servant. We heard about that word bond servant, right? We studied that earlier in Romans 1 1. Okay. Paul, a bond servant of God and an apostle, special messenger, personally chosen representative of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's chosen ones and to we encourage them to recognize and pursue the knowledge of truth which leads to godliness. The knowledge of truth which leads to godliness. I know I was supposed to be reading this, but I got to. <laughs> okay. How do we know to be godly if we are not, again, if we are not in this word? And remember, it's not just about you. Like, I've started changing my prayer now to where I'm like, God, in my quiet time. Like, God, I want this time to be a time where I'm getting to know you and not just knowing stuff about you. Like, even in preparing this lesson, like, God, let me get to draw, let me, allow me to draw closer to you. Allow me to get to know you more instead of just knowing information about you. Like, that is how we become you know, we're taking on his image and we're coming more like him. That's what we know what it means to be godly. By getting to know him through the word and not just knowing some scripture. Because, again, if that was the case, uh, you know, the Pharisees and Sadducees would have been, they would have been good. They knew scripture like the back of their hand. But it wasn't, there was no godliness in them. So it's not enough for me to just be able to, to cite some verses, and I'm not saying that's not important. You do need to know it, okay? Like in Timothy, i got to find the verse. In Timothy, we are expected to know this word. Like that needs to be your goal. Start somewhere, one verse at a time. But you need to know this word, okay? But it's not as we just don't stop there at knowing and memorizing scriptures. We need to take time to really be in his presence. Okay, so it's like you want to know what truth is, get to know God. Know him through his word. Okay, so continuing on, verse 2, based on the hope and divine guarantee of eternal life, the life which God, who is ever truthful and without deceit, promised before the ages of time began. Verse 3. And at the appointed time has made known his word and revealed it as his message through preaching 
which was entrusted to me according to the command of God our Savior. Savior. And that is Titus, verses 1 through 3, chapter 1, Amplified Version. How are they going to hear the truth if we ain't telling them, if we're not teaching them? we got to go teach it. Now, I, in order for me to go teach it, i got to be up under a teacher, right? That's the discipleship thing. If I do not have a teacher, right, as someone told me, it's like, well, you have to, you're going to have to be that person for you until God such, you know, positions you in such a way to where it's like you have access to a discipler. But in the meantime, you get your study tools, you dig, you take the time, you spend the time, you make sure you uh, are surrounded by other believers, right, who have to be, they got to be passionate. They got to be. If you got people, and I'm not saying you just cut them all off, right, like don't do that. But if you spend the majority of your time with people like, oh, I don't take all that, you ain't got to do all that, well, do you know, I don't know if God has really meant that. I don't know if it's that serious. What do you think the attitude is going to start to be in your heart? But if I have people who are holding me accountable, to be like, hey, this can't stop with you because God has commanded us to do this, to go out and teach, to make disciples and, and teach this to not just anybody but to faithful men who are also going to go and commit it to other faithful men, like <laughs> those people are holding me accountable and they're on fire and they're serious about it, then that rubs off. Right? It's just like anything else in life. If there are things that you that God has given you some type of vision or dream or passion and you are surrounded by people who start speaking death and doubt and all types of negativity over that thing, it affects you. And it's like, you know what, I gotta move around. I can't I can't be around this. Yeah, I ain't taking me back over there. <laughs> right? I was like, no, nah, I got to be around people who are like, yeah, let's go. We're, we're serious about this. Let's go. So, yeah, we we have to go and, and tell somebody. Now, going back to verse 2, I just want to do something real quick. Okay. Um, I have some other English translation versions of the Bible, which one of the Bibles I use is U version. Okay. There are so many different translations of the Bible on you version that you can go and read for free. There's an app. Put it on your phone. You're good to go, okay? And so we're just going to read a few of them. We're not going to read all of them because I do have quite a bit, okay? But let's see what it say in, in the King James. So let's look at the Amplified again and then compare these other translations, right? So Titus chapter 1, verse 2, Amplified. Based on the hope and divine guarantee of eternal life, the life which God, who is ever truthful and without deceit, promised before the ages of time began. Uh, King James Version. Oh, hold on, you In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. The Jubilee Bible. For the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the times of the ages. English Standard Version. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. And then, good old Message Bible. Now, Message Bible kind of combined one through four. Okay. But we'll read, you know, the first two. Uh, I, Paul, and God's slave, right, doulos, bondservant, and Christ's agent for promoting the faith among God's chosen people, getting out the accurate word on God and how to respond rightly to it. My aim is to raise hopes by pointing the way to life without end. This is the life God promised long ago, and he doesn't break promises. He doesn't break promises. Why? As it says in the, in the Passion Translation, which rests on the hope of eternal life, God, who never lies, has promised this before time began. 
what is the one thing that you keep hearing in all of those translations, in the majority of them that we read, right? He cannot lie. He never lies. He does not lie. Talking about truthfulness. But the enemy is the father of them. And yet, when he comes creeping in, it's like, do you ever catch yourself for a moment? Like, I've had to catch myself a couple of times. The week has just started. And I've had to catch myself a couple of times like, wait a minute, wait, wait. I know. I know. I am not about to sit here and listen to this dude who is the father of lies. Better tell me about my God who cannot lie, who does not lie, who never lies, who never breaks his promises, who fulfills everything that he promised me he was going to do. Like, nah, we shut that down today. We are shutting that down. Ain't no way. No. Like, what are we doing? Sometimes you need to do that. You need to, like, pause for a minute, like, wait. When you catch yourself, like yesterday, uh, I think it was yesterday, you know, my bestie reminded me, like she had a, a, a Bible study lesson that she attended, and then there was like, yeah, when you're, that anxiety or fear starts rising up, you know, it can cause you to speak death over your life, and you have to speak life over it. You have to start speaking over that anxiety and speaking over your fears and, and those things when they start stirring up. And I was like, girl, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Bessie. I needed that reminder myself. Because y'all know God's preparing me to take this exam, the Japanese exam, but I promise you that sometimes like I start thinking about it and the anxiety just starts getting bad. But I needed that reminder myself. Like, yeah, sometimes you need to take a pause and just be like, wait, no, no. The same will come through your own mouth and have you tearing down your own blessings and tearing down your own harvest. I was like, wait, no, we're not, we're not entertaining that. It's me, okay? Like, we're not entertaining that. Now, we're going to look at this last verse. And we're going to go ahead and uh, close out, okay? The last verse we're going to look at is Hebrews. This is chapter 6, verse 18. Hebrews, chapter 6, and then verse 18, amplified version. So that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God to lie. Uh oh, again, that reminder. We who have fled to him for refuge would have strong encouragement and indwelling strength to hold tightly to the hope set before us. Hmm. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, Amplified Version. I don't know why, but I just feel like I need to read that again. So that by two unchangeable things, we talked about his immutability. He does not change his standard. He can change his attitude or his feelings toward a situation, especially if it's one where we have sinned and we're coming to him in, in sincereness, repenting for the things that we've done. Because he promises that when we do that, when we come to him and we're genuine about it, it's not just like, ooh, I'm sorry I got caught. Uh, ooh, God, can you let this pass? No, like we're broken over it. My God, help me. I'm sorry. When we come to him, he will forgive us of those things. He'll turn it around, right? He'll clean us up. But his standards don't change. And we've seen some other things, right? And the essence of God himself does not change. He's still faithful. He's still truthful. So, in verse 18, so that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to him for refuge would have strong encouragement and indwelling strength to hold tightly to the hope set before us. Hebrews 6, 
verse 18, Amplified Version. Also knows in the Amplified, right, strong encouragement and indwelling strength. Not your strength. Indwelling strength. Strength from the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. Know ye not that ye are a temple of God and the Holy Spirit dwells in you. 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 16, King James. Try to memorize it. <laughs> Try to memorize the verses. You're a holy temple, and his spirit is dwelling in you, and he has all the strength, all the power, everything you need. All you got to do is tap into him. How do you do that? I surrender, and I pray in that moment. I cannot tell you. There have been some times where I was furious, like about to explode, and I had to just be like, Jesus, Jesus, help me today. God, I need you to take over. Before I even go to do these lessons, I pray, and I'm just like, God. Before I literally get on a prayer with the Lord, uh, I need you to take over. You think over today, especially when I feel like my ADHD is out of control or I'm just I'm really tired, which doesn't help your ADHD, by the way. You know, I just feel kind of out of it. I'm like, God, you you really going to have to teach today. Like, I know you be teaching anyway because it's not me doing it, but I really <laughs> need you to do it. When I'm trying to do stuff and I'm trying to get plans together and things, I'm like, God, I'm confused. I don't even know where to start. Help me. I have to acknowledge that, one, I don't know what I'm doing. That requires me to be humble. I have to humble myself before this awesome king and ask for help. Some of us are stuck because we're too prideful to even open our mouth to even admit, I don't know what I don't know, which is nothing. Lord, I don't know, but you do. So can you please help me? It starts there. Now, real quick, because I see you, oh, Lord, Holy Spirit took over. This we're going to say. <laughs> Low key, Holy Spirit did take over. We're going to do this again, right? But this time we're just going to look at it in, in two translations, two other translations. So let's read that again. So Hebrews 6 and 18, Amplified. So that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to him for refuge would have strong encouragement and indwelling strength hold tightly to the hope set before us. I started to say something else, but like, no, next time. <laughs> we got to keep going. New King James, that by two immutable things, I told you that immutability, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. And then the King James, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Oop, okay, one more, y'all, a lot. One more. ESV, oh, I'm sorry, ESV and then HCSV, or Holman Christian Standard. Uh, ESV, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we have fled for refuge, might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. And then finally, Holman Christian Standard, so that through two unchangeable things, are y'all catching it? in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to seize the hope set before us. I cannot do it without God. It is impossible. It's impossible. Without him, I have no hope. None. 
when I'm trying to do it on my own and stuff is falling apart, my hope starts to plead. It starts going away. But when I know who it is that lives in me, when I know that the God in me can do anything, he can do the impossible, I now have that encouragement to continue on. I can hold on to hope. I can hold on to faith. I can keep running on. I can keep pressing forward. Even if I have to pause for a moment to catch my breath, I can still keep moving forward. It's like I'm not going to be in this place forever. It's not always going to be like this. I don't care what the enemy says. If God promised it to me, it's going to happen, and he's going to bring it to pass because he cannot lie. It is impossible. It's impossible for him to lie. So God wouldn't tell me something and then turn back around and be like, well, just kidding, psych. That's not what he does. That's not who he is. We just read the scriptures, right? And we read it in multiple translations to make it clear, like just in case you missed it, the first the first translation, let's read it again. <laughs> Did you catch that one? Let's read it one more time. Did you guess that? Oh, nope. One more time. One more again. It's impossible for him to lie. He cannot and he will not lie to you. The devil will. Every word out of his mouth is a lie. So who are you going to believe? That's why it is crucial that we're getting to know God through his word. He's not going to contradict his word. He's not going to contradict what he said in his word. Because that would make him a liar, which he is not. Whew, y'all, I don't know. Some moving in me. It's like I could say on that, but we already, we already over time, I wouldn't even plan it to to do it this long, but it's something to really think about. Really meditate on that today. If you've been having that kind of week where the enemy has just been having intrusive thoughts and, you know, kind of plant the, that doubt or have you speak against stuff, and there's a lot of stuff going on right now that I see in the world, at least for me personally, that makes me angry, but then I have to immediately speak against that and be like, but God is in control. God is in control. God is in control. The the world, the universe, the entire universe is in his hands. I am in his hands. God is in control. He's going to take care of it. Ain't nothing I can do about that. I'm going to give that to God. I don't have that kind of power. But God does. And he's still moving and working behind the scenes, even when it's not making sense to me, even when it looks like something's not happening, like things are not moving and working the way I think they ought to. It's still happening according to his plan. Because can't nobody stop God. Satan found that out the hard way. He really thought he won, too, when Jesus died. I bet that boy was just excited. And then when Jesus came down and took the keys from him, he was probably looking shot. Oh, <laughs> what? That's why he's so salty. That's why Satan is mad all the time. That's why he hates you so much. Everything I try to do to destroy them, you just, just uh. remember Joe. <laughs> you know. So again, it's like, nah, this, this ain't it for me. What do you mean? So now you know a little bit more about your God today. And I hope that you will take time to go back and read those scriptures so you can know even more about them. And when you're reading those verses, you got, you got all week, ladies. You really got all week. When you're reading those scriptures, really take time to read it and think about that. Like, hmm. Because I guarantee you, there's going to be at least one that's going to speak there's something you're probably dealing with right now that you like, man, I don't know what God going to do for this. You read that verse, you're like, oh, wow, Satan tried it. He really was about to have me out here thinking that God could not 
do anything about this. But he can and he will because he's God. So before I get started all over again, <laughs> let's go ahead and pray out. Lord God, we just want to tell you thank you. God, we thank you for this lesson on, on today. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you are a God who cannot lie. You will not lie to us, God. It is impossible for you to lie to us because you are the truth. Your word is truth, and we can stand on it. When you speak to us and when you speak into our lives, God, we can take that to the bank because every promise you make is a guarantee. Everything you promised us will come to pass. It will happen. It may not happen in the time frame that we prefer it to happen, but all things happen according to your time, and, God, you are always on time, and you know exactly when we need it because you are all-knowing. You know what's coming ahead way before we do. But, God, we thank you for the time that you take to prepare us for those things that are coming ahead. We thank you, God that you are with us in the midst of the storm. We thank you just for being who you are, God, that you love us. We thank you for your mercy, for your faithfulness, even when we're not. When we fall short, God, and you covered us. So, Lord, we praise you on today. We give you all the glory and all the praise and all the thanks, and we just pray that your words will resonate in every single, each and every single one of us, God. And we pray, Lord, that whatever seeds you have planted here on today, whatever truth, whatever things that you have given us, God, on today, that we would go and then share that with somebody else. Each and every single person listening right now, God, I pray that you would plant something in them to go and plant seeds in somebody else or to water that seed in somebody else so that person can hold on tightly to your hope as well. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We love you, we adore you, God, and we glorify your name. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen and amen. (laughs) Well, I won't say it like this, but I'm just saying it. Go and celebrate your God today. I don't care what kind of week it's looking like. Notice I said it's looking like. Your week might have started off bad. It could have started off bad from jump, from the start of the year. But in spite of what it looks like, celebrate your God for who he is because he's still God regardless of whatever situation you're in or whatever he's going through. Remember, it's not always going to be like this. Seasons are temporary, but your God does not change. He's still faithful In in a season, out of season. He's still truthful in a season, out of season. He's still powerful in season and out of season. And all he literally has to do is speak a word. That's all he has to do. And through your mouth, either you're going to tear them things down or you're going to speak in faith with the confidence that God is going to make a way, that God is going to change that situation and those mountains are going to start to be removed. Remember, it's not by our faith, right? It's his faith. And by me accepting it in faith, I'm accepting everything God has for me. Everything. And I want everything. I don't want to abort my own blessings by speaking curses over myself. Not doing that no more. I I told y'all about that. I was doing that for a long time. I ain't doing that no more. My mind started to go there. I'm like, nope. You thought. So do that this week. Speak over yourself. Give your God praise. Glorify him. Celebrate him. If all you can do is just when you start to feel kind of negative or whatever, just immediately just start giving him thanks. Go over those scriptures. Start speaking them scriptures over yourself. Start with one. And when you got that one down, move on to another one. All right? I love y'all.
<laughs> Y'all take care. Have a great week. Be sure to join us for Thursday. Everybody Bible study. And God bless, ladies. Bye.